morning. have a couple things for you. Um, those of you that I had clearances for, I have passed these packets out with all the instructions that you need. Most of um, the church clearances ran out three, four, five months ago. But with COVID, it's been really hard for everybody to get them done. Um, if I gave you one of these, you have it. If I didn't have your information in the past, then you didn't get one, but there's more of these packets that make it really easy for you to do everything you need. And if you are a teacher or a nurse or whatever and already have them, I just need a copy. Okay, so I didn't make you out a packet because I know you already have them and you can get them to me. So that's something you can work on. And I don't believe anyone attached to this church has to do fingerprinting. I think all of us have been in Pennsylvania for 10 years and can just do the affidavit. Um, so keep that in mind, because that's the real stickler. It's really, really hard right now to get fingerprints completed. The rest of it, piece of cake. Keep that in mind. Other announcements, what else? At this quiet time of COVID. Hello to everybody that is watching, that are watching this online. And welcome, um, stay safe, don't get sick, but uh, welcome to our worship. And you can be a part of any activities that go on, even though you are watching from home. Anything else? Okay, let's join together in the call to worship. You'll notice at the top it says Psalms 4, 9, 65, 66. Those, your responses are from the Psalms. I'll be reading something different for Thanksgiving, but that's part of it is the psalm. So please stand. Gracious God, today we are thankful, most of all, for you. Without you, we cannot even breathe. You provide rhythm to our hearts and lives. You are our protector, our guide, our strength, our creator and our redeemer. We are thankful for your omnipotent presence among us. We give you thanks to you, O oh God. We give thanks for your spirit is near. God, you created this wonderful terrestrial ball known as the planet Earth and the entire galaxy of which it is a part. You are the provider and the sustainer of all life for all time and in all continuums. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. We are thankful for our nation, broken and fallen though she is, we are thankful for our liberties, for our unalienable rights, and especially the ability to worship you in safety and freedom. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. We are thankful for the leadership of our country. Continue to guide our leaders, give them hearts to serve, and keep them safe from harm. Let the light of your face shine upon them, O Lord. We are thankful for the wonderful changing of the seasons and for the bountiful harvest after a summer of growth. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. We are thankful for community services, for community shelters, food pantries, nursing homes, police and fire protection, 
churches, schools, hospitals, and libraries. You are awesome, O God, in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. We are thankful for this community of faith. Keep us true and steadfast in living by your word. Let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. We are thankful for the many blessings you provide for us, food, shelter, clothing, employment, health, and education. I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. If you look at the very front of your bulletins at the top, it tells you the special significance of today. Today is Christ the King Sunday. Today is the last day of the church year, the last Sunday of the church year. Um, it also, we pay attention to the cultural thing today of Thanksgiving. And that's where we're, we're worshiping about it today. And of course, Thanksgiving is Thursday. The church year has a particular rhyme and reason to it. I have some of these. They are in um, the other room on the table if you want to take one home. It shows the church year, and then on the back it explains everything that goes on in the course of the year. So we are right here. We are at Christ the King Sunday. We have a few more days of it, and then next Sunday we begin well, Advent. Um, Advent, the four weeks of penitence and um, oh, anticipation, I guess, of the coming of the Lord. And, and you look at it in two ways. It's not only the coming of the Lord as a baby in Bethlehem, but it's also the coming of the Lord again as the ruler, as the king, as, as the uh, prince of peace. We have Christmas Day, and then you go through the 12 days of Christmas, which is the Christmas season. In our culture, pretty much everyone, when Christmas Day is over, Christmas is over, but not for the church. For the church, it's just beginning. And there's 12 days that go to Epiphany. Then you have some um, ordinary time in here where we talk about the life of Jesus. And then we get, again, to another time of penitence during Lent. Start with Ash Wednesday, go all the way up to Good Friday, and then, of course, Easter. Go from there into the Easter season to Ascension Sunday and then Pentecost, which is usually around Memorial Day, uh, if not right on it. And then starts a long period of time where we talk about different things that Jesus did and the activities that happened in the early church. It's a long period of ordinary time throughout the summer. That's the church year, and it cycles every year. There is a rhyme and a reason to what we do and, and when we do it. It's a three-year cycle, year A, B, and C. We are now finishing year A, where we have been paying closer attention to the Gospel of Matthew. Next year, B is Luke, and then year C is a combination of Mark and John that are the focus. So. Keep that in mind, it's, um, it's pretty important stuff because you can keep your mind on what the, what the early church did and where we are and the focus on Christ's life by keeping attached to that. Okay, would you stand please for the confession? Holy One of Israel, we bow before you humbly and joyfully, for you alone are king. 
both powerful ruler and gentle shepherd of us all. We depend upon your mercy, for we have sinned. We have neglected your call to seek the lost, comfort those who grieve, bind up the injured, and strengthen the weak. We have failed to hope and work for justice. We have ignored your face in the stranger in need before us. Forgive us, we pray. Gather and direct us that we may live as your faithful people, seeing as you see, loving as you love, forgiving others as you have forgiven us. Amen. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. We are a new people, equipped with fresh vision and a powerful purpose to reach out as Christ's hands and feet, ministering to a needy world. Leave behind your self-imposed limitations and give your best to the one who needs what you have to give. Remembering that when you serve the least, you serve the Lord. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. I'll catch you up on Darby. I got a sick puppy dog. Um, Monday and Tuesday we didn't walk, or Sunday and Monday because the weather was bad. Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon we went for a walk, and when I got to where I could let her go, she was so full of energy. And she's bouncing and running and jumping, and you know how you can tell when a dog is smiling? She was just in heaven just to be out like that. And it doesn't take her long to slow down. She's 10 years old. Um, so we were walking along and she looked weird. And I said something to her and she took a couple steps and staggered and just went down um, and stopped breathing. And I, I thought my dog had died. I thought her heart had quit. You know, that the jumping and running around and that she had had a heart attack and was gone. And over the course of about 20 minutes, I mean, for the longest time, there was no movement at all. And then an ear twitched. And I looked and like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and then finally she lifted her head. And five minutes later, she rolled up to her side. And five minutes later, she stood up. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So I didn't know whether she'd had a seizure or what had happened. Um, so we, we gently walked home because would you believe that was the day I was getting winter treads and everything on and I didn't have a car. Couldn't do anything. Um, so we walked home very slowly. Well, she seemed like she was over it, although she seemed tired. And late that afternoon, we went out to the shed for something and Mike Patrick was out there and his dog was out there and Darby said hello to both of them and seemed fine. And we went into the shed and she collapsed again. Same thing, stopped breathing, um, just laid there. And I hollered at Braden to come out. I said, I think your dog is dying. You need to get out here. And he did and he ran out and threw himself down on her. And when he did, her body jumped she started breathing. Um, got her into the vet, and um, he said, and you might want to know this, boxers are prone to heart disease. Okay, good thing to know. I had no idea. And it's, he thinks it's called right atrium 
um, whatever, I can't think of the word now. Arrhythmia, there it is. And, um, but he couldn't find anything. They did a ton of tests and he, they couldn't find anything. And he said, I, I can't give you any medicine because I don't know what we're looking at yet. Everything looks normal. He said, I have to send this out to specialists and let them take a look. So he did that and he called oh, about five, oh no wait, we're not done yet. <laughs> He said, I can't give you anything, so we're talking and we're about to leave. And we look down and she's gone. She's gone. Um, and they grabbed her, took her back, hollered for the crash cart. That was scary to listen to all that. Gave her oxygen, put an IV in, and she came around again. Um, so when all this, everything calmed down, then he said, I, I can't give you anything yet. Just be very careful, don't let her go outside, don't let her exercise, don't let her walk, keep her very quiet. So we did that, and he called later on and ordered meds for her from the pharmacy. Um, he said one person had called back, the, the doctor that was looking at the ECG, and he thought he saw one little place of arrhythmia, which causes that, your heart to flutter, what's that called? AFib, AFib, and apparently she is going into AFib and whatever we were doing was waking her heart back up and when it would start working again because she wasn't getting any oxygen, then she'd slowly wake up again. Um, scary, very scary, and um, boy, it happened fast. So where we are right now is she's taking the meds this morning, she acted more like Darby than I've seen her in a month or two. So things must have been happening, and I was just thinking it was old age. And um, she, she might, it must be slowing the heart down, and she must be getting more oxygen. She seemed like a happier dog this morning. She wanted to play and stuff like that. So we'll see how it goes, and hopefully I have to take her back in Friday for more tests again and see if they've caught it in time. So, she's my bud, you know, it's really hard to go walking without my dog. And, uh, and when I try to get out the door and she's looking at me going, Are, aren't I coming? You know, it just, it breaks my heart. And the paths just don't seem right without her on them with me. But that's where she is, and, and I'll tell you what, that was scary. Very scary to see your dog lay in there like that. Not once, but three times she did it. Uh, and then the third time in the vet's office, I was really glad it happened there. So, what else? That was a long story about a dog. Okay, let's bow our heads. Lord, the list is long this morning, and, and we admit to our fears. We've gone through so many months of COVID outbreak that hasn't touched us. And now it is here, and there are people we know who are suffering with it. And now there are people we know who have passed away from it and gone home to you. And we worry. We worry about our loved ones. We worry about ourselves. We worry about the elderly in, in our community who we know are fragile to begin with. We ask your protection for all of them, for all of us. And where there is illness, Lord, we ask your presence and your comfort. On this day that we are giving thanks, it, it's been a hard time to be thankful. So much has changed and so much has been canceled 
And yet if we stop to really think about it, there is still much to be grateful for. We are blessed. And we are blessed to know you. Because above and beyond anything that the world can give or take away, there is you. You will never leave. You will never forsake us. You will never turn your back on our prayers. You give us strength. And you give us presence through your spirit. And Lord, on on this Christ the King Sunday, you give us the Lord on his throne. You give us the sure knowledge of his coming once again in power and in glory. All of that, all of that, we are so thankful for. Grant us your presence. Grant us your vision, your power to help others to speak a word of comfort in this time of upheaval. And we ask it all in your son's name, who taught us when we pray to say our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever. Okay, on this Christ the King Sunday, the first year, the year A of the the cycle, um, this is the end of Matthew for us. We've been in the 25th chapter of Matthew now for a number of weeks, and this finishes it out. Listen to the word of God. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, He will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, 
Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Well, folks, we've gone and done it. We've worked our way through the Gospel of Matthew and the end of Matthew now, the chapters that are left, if you were to read them, are Jesus' arrest, trial, death, and resurrection, and ascension. And that, of course, we don't hit until Lent and Easter. And over the last three or four weeks, we've worked our way all the way through chapter 25, too. We had the parable of the ten bridesmaids with the oil that ran out. They weren't ready. We had the parable of the three servants and the talents that their landowner gave them and how the one failed. And now, uh, this is a kind of, sort of parable about the sheep and goats. And this passage, by the way, is pretty much Matthew's theology in a nutshell. This is what you take from it. It's a scene of the coming judgment coupled with the imperatives that Jesus gave us in the Sermon on the Mount. So if you go all the way back to Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, these are the things he said we were to do as his disciples. And then here at the end, he pulls it together. So as of today... We're done with Matthew, and next week begins a whole new year. So, first a word or two about sheep and goats. It's no secret that Matthew's Jesus has been focusing on the coming judgment, on being prepared, on the final culmination of the reign of God on earth. He was very clear, right? Stay awake, be ready, do the right things with the gifts you've been given to grow them and grow the kingdom. But here's now this business about sheep and goats. Up until this point, Jesus has clearly told us that he is the shepherd of both the sheep and goats. And they're all mixed together. And now it's judgment time and the goats are going to be called out. Now the word for goats in Greek, by the way, is the word for young males who are for the most part slaughtered for food. It's kind of like male dairy cows, except for the one or two that you might keep to be bulls for breeding. A male dairy cow is no good at all and usually they are slaughtered for veal. So these male goats were no good for keeping, no good for hanging around. Um, you keep the, the females for the babies, for the milk. You keep one or two males for breeding. But pretty much the young males, goats, are just worthless except to eat them. Now, male sheep, you could at least keep and shear them for the wool. Male goats ate your food, took your time, bothered everybody else around them, and were worthless. So the issue in the parables is trying to figure out what all this stands for. And this one, pretty much, is only one thing. This, these, these sheep and these goats. These sheep and these goats are us. The Lord is my shepherd. They're us. We're the sheep and the goats. Doesn't make you feel real good, does it? No matter how you cut it, being compared to sheep and goats is not the most flattering thing in the world. But we're being told by none other than the king himself that there are members of the flock who are worthless and have been sucking the life out of others for a long time. And he says they're out of here. It's kind of sobering to know that there are some among us who will not enter the kingdom of God. There are some among us who 
maybe even come to church, who think they're Christians, who are superficial in their faith at best, who aren't really exciting about doing much of anything for anybody except themselves. And they're not coming to the party. And when we or they say to Christ, why can't I come to the party? Jesus tells them the rest of the story. To the sheep, he says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was in prison, you came to see me. But to the goats, he says, you saw me hungry. You didn't care. You saw me naked. You didn't give me any clothes. And you knew that I was in prison and you never saw me, you never visited me. And of course, everybody turns to him and says, when, when did we see you? And then you have that most famous of biblical lines, when you did this or didn't do this for the least among you, that was me. Well, we sit back in amazement one way or the other and we go, oh, I didn't know that that was you. And Jesus says, oh, yes, you did. I told you over and over how you are supposed to treat me. Treat the least. You know, years ago when I worked for the domestic violence program, people would come in occasionally and make donations for women and children that were in crisis. And, and a lot of them had to set up apartments and things like that. And, and most of these people would, would truly, truly give out of compassion and concern for the plight of these families. But then you could tell that for others, their motives were a little bit off. People would give us this dirty used furniture. Like somebody in that kind of crisis would be built up by a filthy couch. There was one very well off, in fact, she was rich. One rich, rich woman who would come in and she would bring in body lotions, fragrances, shampoos, costume jewelry, all things that had been opened and used a few times, but she really didn't like them. So she wanted to give them to other people. And she would say to us, you know, just top them off with something and nobody will ever know. I do not believe she saw Jesus in those battered women. And we got a lot of used toys and a lot of dirty teddy bears for the kids. And we were supposed to dust them off and wrap them up, put them in Santa's bag. I would hazard a guess that some of that, us do that with the shoe boxes. We're not doing shoe boxes this year, but if we were, if it was our grandson, we'd buy him the matchbox car. But for the shoe box, well, you know, the cheaper little store car is good enough. Our granddaughter would get the Barbie doll. The shoe box gets the five and 10 Barbie lookalike. There is value and wisdom in getting the most bang for the buck. Our money doesn't grow on trees, but when we cognitively look at Barbie and the store brand Stella side by side and think, eh, the cheap one is good enough for this, then we're not seeing Jesus in that little girl that's going to open that box. Last week, the Boy Scouts did their food thing here in Alkland. And they brought all the food to the food pantry. And I am forever astounded at the whole box of canned goods that are already outdated when people give them to the food pantry. 
We can bring along and give them a couple of cans of those five for a dollar beans and we're, we're never gonna miss that. Or we can throw in that old can of Arctic choke hearts that's been in the cabinet for a hundred years. <laughs> Or the stuff that's lost is its label, and we really don't know, don't laugh. I have palm hearts or something there right now. <laughs> palm hearts. I don't even I don't even know what that is. And, and <laughs> anyway, we can rationalize and we can say, well, I have seen way too many people go to get food at a food bank who really didn't need it and misuse our gifts. And that, that could be, and it does happen. There are a few who are gonna do that. But first of all, their use or misuse of a food pantry, that's between them and God. God knows whether they need it. And secondly, I still wouldn't wanna be in their shoes. Somebody once asked Mother Teresa how she could go from one dying person to the next, to the next, and do what she did in the filthy streets of Calcutta. And she said that she could because for her, every face she looked at was the face of the one she loved. Every face was the face of Christ. Christmas time is upon us. The appeals come in to help out financially with you name it. Every denomination, nursing home, camps, kids things, shoe boxes, overseas, goodies for our troops. There's a million places that we can give and most of us help out as best we can. And we do it as often as we can. We give from the heart, we give with joy. We give with gratitude for all that we've been given. We give not just out of the abundance of what we have, over, have left over, but we give sacrificially our time, talents, our treasure. It's what we do. It's what a neighbor is supposed to do for a neighbor. We don't do it to be noticed. We don't do it for applause. We just do it because we ought to do it. We're Christians in sheep clothing. We're salt and light and yeast in a dark world. Most of us never stop for a moment to realize whose face it is behind those we serve. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it for the least of those who are members of my family, you did it for me. We can't worry about the goats. First of all, it's not a problem. They know who they are and so does God. And we can't worry about the goats because we ought to be too busy doing the right stuff, the caring stuff, the compassionate stuff. Unlike the natural world where a sheep is always a sheep and a goat can never hope to be anything other than a goat, the kingdom of God makes different rules. The very best sheep among us can once in a while be found to be acting like a real goat. And even the goats can sometimes get it right. The good news of the gospel is that you're not stuck being who you are if you're not content being who you are. Sheep can become better sheep and goats can change their spots and boy is that a mixed metaphor. <laughs> On every day and in every needy face we have the chance to take a run at it again and get it right. Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty? When was it you were a stranger and we welcomed you or naked? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Isn't God amazing? 
when he could claim a place for himself on any throne that the world had to offer, when he could be among us with power and might and majesty, instead, he chooses to take the place of a little child or a battered wife or a dying untouchable in a Calcutta gutter or an elderly neighbor or one of a million different disguises that he can come in. Keep awake, keep your eyes open, be ready because you never know when or where you will meet him face to face. The passage is remarkable in its theological statement to end the church year. So on this Christ the King Sunday, Sunday, we're presented with a Jesus who has all this power and splendor. He's the classic judging son of man as told to us by the prophets. And yet here he is as a shepherd with sheep and goats. King upon this eternal royal throne. And yet a son doing his father's bidding. He is Jesus the Christ, prophet, priest, and king, and Lord of all with immense power, and yet he will be coming among us, born as a powerless infant. When did we see you among us? Truly I tell you, just as you did it for the least of these, you did it unto me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Please stand. Let's affirm our faith from the Heidelberg Catechism. Question 86. Since we are redeemed from our sin and its wretched consequences by grace through Christ without any merit of our own, why must we do good works? Because just as Christ has redeemed us with his blood, he also renews us through his Holy Spirit according to his own image, so that with our whole life we may show ourselves grateful to God for his goodness and that he may be glorified through us. And further, so that we ourselves may be assured of our faith by its fruits and by our reverent behavior may win our neighbors to Christ. Even so, Lord, quickly come to thy finest, final harvest home. Gather in your people. That is always the hope of the church, that we work toward that day that Christ has come and is in the world, but he has not yet come again to take us home. Give thanks with a grateful heart. And now go in peace and may the love of God, the grace through our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>